It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Paul Browning, who will be our, our preacher today, according to Daniel. Um, Paul is no stranger to Carnegie Mellon. He got his bachelor's degree in material science here in 1990. Uh, after uh, finishing at Carnegie Mellon, he went on to a series of uh, increasingly more responsible leadership positions in the energy sector. He was CEO of uh, GE Power, CEO of Irving Oil, and CEO of uh, Mitsubishi Power Americas, uh, three very substantial companies, and it shows you the breadth of his experience as a leader uh, in this sector. Uh, a few months ago, he created a new uh, effort for him. It's a departure and an exciting one. Continuum Renewables, it's called, and you'll be hearing more about it from Paul. Um, and it's uh, really exciting. We're looking forward to uh, many Carnegie Mellon spin-offs getting involved in uh, Paul's new venture. Uh, we're delighted by Paul's engagement with the university. He doesn't just come back to talk to us from time to time. He's involved as a, an advisor to our college. Uh, he has supported research here, and it's my great pleasure to welcome back Paul Browning. Yeah, good. You guys had a good week? Um, so, hey, what I'm going to be talking about today is something that I think is really important to entrepreneurs, which is sort of how do you, how do you figure out when things are going to happen in the energy industry? Um, and, and, you know, we all know, you know, you don't want to be late and miss something, but as an entrepreneur, it's really just as bad to be too early because, you know, you get your funding, you got a burn rate for your business, and if you're a few years early, you burn through your money before the market really materializes. So something I've spent you know, a lot of my career doing is trying to time, the, time new, new product introductions just right. And if you get it just right, the benefit is, you, you know, I've been in, through businesses where it just feels like the wind's in your face, you know, and it's just really, really hard. If you time it right, you just feel like the wind's at your back. And, the orders are flowing in, and you know it's it's just a wonderful feeling. So, um, so, so that's uh, really what I'm going to try to get across to you today. And then I've just got one slide at the end to talk a little bit about this new venture I'm, I've um, started, and uh, uh, and I'll leave you contact info in case you when some of you might be a good fit. By the way, I just want to say, uh, you know, the first time I spoke here, I think it was five years ago, um, I met somebody here. I ended up hiring him. He launched a uh, renewable energy project development business in PV Solar in here in, in Pittsburgh. Um, they now have 30 employees. They have five gigawatts of uh, PV Solar projects in various stages of development. Um, so, you know, part of the reason I come back here is it's been good for me too. So, um, nope. So, First of all, if you're thinking about energy, you have to think exponentially. Uh, my first job out of Carnegie Mellon was studying how cracks grow in gas turbine alloys and, uh, and everything, it, crack growth is exponential. And so you get used to thinking, you know, in log-log space, you know, like exponential uh, uh, scales on things. And so on the left side here is um, total human energy consumption, not electricity, energy. So this is everything. Um, on the, in the, the blue line on the left. And, and you can see it's, it's increasing you know, at an exponential rate. And at the bottom is renewable power production, which it's hard to see on this linear chart is, is also uh, growing exponentially. But you know, the, the criticism of renewables for my whole career has been they don't matter. They're one or 2% of total human energy consumption. Like, who cares? Um, on the right side, I've just converted that linear chart into one that has a, uh, you know, an exponential vertical axis. And, and what happens is uh, an exponential turns into a straight line when you plot it here, and the, the, the slope of that line tells you the growth exponent. And so uh, two things with the same slope are growing at the same rate, and you can see here the problem with renewables is they are growing exponentially, but they are growing at the same rate as human energy consumption. They never catch up. Um, and that's why they're still just a few percent uh, even, even today. But, um, but the data I just showed you were through 2003 or so, I think, for the um, renewables. Uh, this is through 2023, and there's something really, really interesting happening that's really important to any energy entrepreneur. 
Um, so human energy consumption continues to grow. The, um, the green dots here, which are sort of, most of them are underneath the blue ones, uh, that is um, hydropower uh, growth rate. And hydro has always been the largest renewable energy source, and so it's dominated the growth rate of renewables that I just showed you on the last slide. The reason that renewables hasn't, haven't been catching up is because renewables are growing at about the same, or hydro is growing at about the same pace as human energy consumption. The red dots here are um, biofuels and, and other bio kinds of energy. And they are growing a little bit faster, you know, they have a little bit higher growth exponent, but they're never gonna catch up with total human energy consumption. The uh, light blue dots here that have the steeper slope, uh, that's wind and solar. Um, that's intermittent renewable power. And, the, and that's really important. The intermittent renewable power is what's really going, growing rapidly. And if you sum them up, you get the dark blue. And you can see the dark blue has now started to deviate from the hydro growth rate. And it's because uh, intermittent renewables have now gotten large enough that they're actually driving what's happening. And if you, if you extrapolate that growth rate forward, it's actually around 2040 where renewable power production intersects total human energy consumption. And most people don't see this coming because most people are linear thinkers um, and people still think, oh, renewables are just a few percent. Guess what? This decade that we are about to run, uh, live through is gonna be a decade where renew intermittent renewable power becomes the major source of energy on our planet which is a really exciting thing um, if you are an energy transition entrepreneur, but it has some really profound implications. Um, so one of the things to understand here is that right now today, you plug a, your, you know, your hair dryer or your whatever into a, a wall socket, um, the electricity you're consuming was, was produced in the same instant you consumed it. There's almost no storage on the electric power grid right now. And so um, it's, it's really sort of an amazing thing of human ingenuity that we've got this thing that just magically matches supply and demand, you know, by the millisecond. Um, so when, when, all of our, when almost all of our electricity and energy is coming from intermittent renewables, that's a big problem. Because when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing, we still need to be able to plug things in, right? So, um, and, and we're already seeing big evidence that this is a problem in, in places that already have a lot of renewable penetration, for example, on the left is the famous duck curve from California. I'm not gonna spend time explaining that. I think most people know that, but you know, the bottom line is um, as you put more and more solar on in California, the, the belly of the duck goes down, but the, the peak continues to go up. And so um, you need something for, for that peak demand. Uh, and it's not intermittent renewables right now. And then in the, on the right is, um, you know, the wind belt in the United States is sort of in the mid-continent. We've, got, we've now got places in the United States where more than 25% of the time, the cost of electricity is negative. And the reason is that you know, we need to curtail because we're overproducing versus what's, what's needed. So, um, so th these are just you know, early market signals that there's a big problem with the intermittency of renewables as they become a larger and larger portion of the grid. And then, and, and that's sort of like short duration kinds of issues, but we also have longer duration things and you know, people are, familiar with the, the heat wave we had out west, uh, I guess it was two summers ago, uh, the heat dome where you know, you know, they, you know, they almost got into rolling blackouts in California and then Storm Uri, a winter storm in, in Texas that knocked out the Texas grid for the better part of a week, 200 people died. You know, this is more seasonal, longer term um, uh, uh, intermittency that also requires a solution. So. So if we need to store energy, we need to store electricity, it's sort of interesting to think about, well, how do we store fossil fuels? Um, coal, is, which is a solid at room temperature, we just put it in a big pile outside of the power plant. It's literally just sitting out there in the rain, you know, it's a bunch of rocks, it doesn't care. Um, oil, which is a liquid at, at uh, room temperature and pressure, we store in um, above ground um, tanks for the most part and it's very energy dense, it works very well. And then natural gas, which is a gas at room temperature, we actually, although you see like liquefied natural gas tanks above ground, it's like a very small percentage of the total, almost all of our natural gas is stored underground in geologic formations and in pipelines. So as we think about the future, um, 
and you know, how are we going to store electricity, how are we going to store energy, it's sort of interesting to think about, well, how are we doing it today with fossil fuels? Um, and particularly when we start talking about things like hydrogen, it's actually pretty relevant. So how does the power grid work today? How does it keep this perfect balance at all the time? Um, it's really important to distinguish between energy producers and capacity producers. So on the energy side, um, we, we have things like coal and nuclear, which are actually anti-intermittent in the sense that when you turn a nuclear power plant on, you never want to shut it off. You just want to run a nuke full out all the time. Most coal-fired power plants are, are uh, designed to, to behave the same way, and hydro, for the most part, is also designed to behave the same way. And so these are, these are producers of energy, not because they're intermittent like renewables, it's because you can't turn them off. And so if you, if you produce too much, you actually have to store you know, the extra. Um, on the other hand, as I said earlier, intermittent renewables um, are also energy because you can't turn them on and off. You know, they're, they're on when the wind blows, they're on when the sun shines. And so the, the way that we handle that is mostly with natural gas. Um, and so there's combined cycle power plants, which are very, very efficient um, ways of converting natural gas into electricity. Um, and then we have peaker power plants, which are very inefficient ways of converting natural gas into electricity, but they're super flexible. And so between the combined cycles and the peakers, they are actually, most of them are actually controlled by the grid itself. And, the, and as, as frequency starts to dip, they tell the, the power plants to run a little harder, and when frequency gets a little bit too high, they tell them to, to turn down, and they're just constantly doing this to match supply and demand. So it's, it's interesting, I mean, it's, it's, it's important to understand that because when we think about how a power grid will work without fossil fuels, um, we have to think about how are we going to replace those natural gas power plants or, you know, the, the, the function of those. And this is, this is the, the way I think this is going to go. Um, on the left, we've got intermittent renewable power, and we're actually going to have to produce quite a bit more power than we actually need. Um, and the reason is that when we store this, you know, storage always has a loss associated with it. So we're going to have to produce more than we need. We're going to lose some by storing what we need to store, uh, but that's what we're going to need to supply 100% of our energy. And, and here, we're going to be, when, when renewables are just energy, it's okay if, they're, if we're not using every single bit we can um, and, and, and we can just get the lowest cost. But when they need to be capacity, it's actually going to pay off to do things like two axis trackers where we, you know, instead of single axis trackers. And so some of the things I'm thinking about investing in are, are things that are going to make our, make our renewables more productive because when they're capacity, they're, you're actually going to get paid for that. But then as we move to the right, battery energy storage is going to, you know, it's good for storing power for, you know, let's say one hour to four hours. It's got a, a very high round trip efficiency of 91%, and so you don't lose that much power when you use it. Um, the first thing that's going on the grid, and everybody knows this is happening right now, is battery energy storage. Um, uh, and and it's, it's being used to meet those short-term, you know, duck curve kind of, kind of issues. The next is... Um, what I think of as gravity storage, because you know, pumped hydro is just another form of gravity storage. So there's various forms of gravity storage. Um, they have about 80% round trip efficiency, and, and they're good for what I think of as you know, intermediate term, let's say two hours to 24 hours of storage. And they get us sort of so that we, we're, we're, we have 24 seven capacity. And then things like green hydrogen um, are where the really long duration energy storage is gonna come from. Now there's a big penalty going to green hydrogen. It's only 40% round trip efficiency. So you put in 100 megawatt hours, you only get 40 megawatt hours back. The, however, the reason we're gonna have some of this on the grid is for things like Storm Uri, the heat dome in, in California and other things. These first two, they just don't have enough duration to, to be there when we need them. And so uh, not a very, not a, a tremendous amount of this, but there's, there's gonna be, enough of it required, it'll be a very nice industry to be in. And, and I should say with green hydrogen, this is, of course green hydrogen is also gonna play in industrial uses and mobility and other things, so uh, it's not just gonna play in, in power generation. Okay, um, the other thing is about renewables, uh, intermittent renewables is where we, we have the greatest intermittent, intermittent renewables is not necessarily co-located with where we've got the greatest energy demand. And so, for example, if you look at this wind map of the United States, the, the, the yellow lights are, you know, uh, 
the US from, a, from space with no cloud cover. So it's basically a, a proxy for energy consumption and uh, our electricity consumption. And then the, the green is where we, where we produce wind. Um, you know, the, the, where we produce wind in the, in the mid-continent of the United States, nobody lives there. Um, sorry if I've offended anybody who actually lives there, but uh, you know, and look at, the, look at the sort of southeast of the United States. There's, there's really uh, quite a bit of energy consumption there and the wind resource is really poor. Um, and on the other side, I've just shown, shown the whole world for PV solar, well, for solar uh, energy and you know places like Western Europe, the Eastern United, Northeastern United States, um, where there's lots of energy consumption, they have a really poor renewable resource or, or solar resource. So, uh, so we're, we're going to need to be able to move um, renewable power not only through time with energy storage, but through space um, to, to bring it from where it's produced to where it's needed. So, how do we move energy through time and or through space? I talked earlier about how we store uh, fossil fuels. The way we move energy today is, um, in, you know, of course, electricity through transmission, um, oil and natural gas through pipeline, coal moves through rail cars and barges. And then I've shown in the middle here, um, hydrogen today, we have 1,600 miles of hydrogen pipelines in the Gulf Coast of the United States. We have three uh, salt caverns in the Gulf Coast of the United States that store hydrogen. We, we already know how to store hydrogen and move it um, the same way we do natural gas. Um, and this is how we're gonna, this is how we're gonna move hi hydrogen across continents um, from, you know, from one area of a continent to another. With, um, but when you, when you need to move it from one continent to another, again, you know, with, with oil, we've got these ultra large crude carriers, LNG, we've got, you know, LNG carriers, coal, um, you know, just again, pile it in there and, in a barge and send it. Uh, the way we're gonna move green hydrogen is through things like green ammonia or green methanol, um, where it's just similar to fossil fuels, we're gonna load them on a, on a vessel and, uh, and away it goes. And the reason we probably won't move it as liquid hydrogen is, is just hydrogen has to get really cold and there's boil off that happens that by the time you get from, you know, Australia to Europe, it's all gone. So, uh, so, that, so that's why things like ammonia are gonna be carriers. All right, so every, I think everybody in this room knows that lithium-ion battery storage is, is already happening. There's no news there, but these longer duration storage projects are also happening. Um, I was involved in, with a, in a lot of them when I was at Mitsubishi, um, and so I'm gonna just talk a little bit. There's one in particular we did that's in Delta, Utah. Um, this project has already reached financial close. It got a $500 million loan from the U.S. Department of Energy Loan Program Office. $388 million equity syndicate from a bunch of blue chip equity providers. So it's got almost a billion dollars of financing in place. Constru it's already under construction. Um, there's, a two, there's a retiring coal-fired power plant there that has a two gigawatt HVDC line that goes from U Utah into the LA basin. This is a major source of energy for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Um, when, when LA is long renewable power in the future. When it has too much renewables that they would otherwise curtail, they're gonna ship it down this two gigawatt HVDC line to Delta, Utah. We're gonna convert it into green hydrogen using uh, uh, high pressure alkaline electrolyzers, 220 megawatts of them in, in phase one. It's gonna get stored in, in two uh, salt caverns um, that combined have the capacity to store 300 gigawatt hours of renewable power. Just to put that in context, every lithium, every lithium ion battery in service on planet Earth today is less than 300 gigawatt hours. So this is just a massive uh, energy storage project. And then that hydrogen is gonna be turned back into electricity by putting it through the same kind of combined cycle power plant that is used to convert natural gas into electricity. Um, this, this, it's an 840 megawatt power plant that is gonna um, convert that hydrogen back into electricity and it's under construction, goes into commercial operation in 2024. Um, so this, this, this kind of stuff, like I said, it's already happening. And then uh, what's coming, and, and I know this because you know, I'm in all these pictures, um, that's Mary Kipp, the CEO of Puget Sound Energy, which is in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. They signed up to do something similar. El Paso Electric um, just bought um, two hydrogen-capable gas turbines from Mitsubishi, they're getting ready for, for doing this. 
um, Entergy, um, you know, big utility in, in the Gulf Coast of the United States, um, just got, uh, just got um, uh, uh, regulatory approval just a couple weeks ago, and which mean, when they get regulatory approval, it's sort of like getting financial close if you're a private company. Um, they're gonna build a 1.2 gigawatt um, combined cycle power plant that has hydrogen capability and uh, New Fortress Energy just announced that they are putting in um, 200 megawatts of electrolysis near the spindle top salt dome. Uh, and this, so this project is, is about to go under, into construction as well. Um, so, uh, so this longer duration storage stuff, it's actually starting to happen um, as we speak. And of course, the other just sort of earthquake thing that happened late last year is the Inflation Reduction Act. And, a year before that, the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, you know, here in the United States, we're gonna have just massive government support to do all these kinds of things I just talked about. The Europeans are gonna copy what we did here in the US, the Canadians are gonna copy it, the Australians are gonna copy it. Globally, there's just gonna be massive government support for the energy transition, which if you're an energy transition entrepreneur is, is super exciting. So. Part of the reason I just sort of made a decision to get out of the big company thing and start my own business is, you know, energy is a scale business. Like, I've always felt like I have to have a big balance sheet standing behind me in order to do anything that matters in energy. Well, I've now got the U.S. Treasury standing behind me as, a, as an entrepreneur, and, and uh, you know, I think it, it, this is the time um, to go out on your own. And so, uh, so I just uh, started a new business. I uh, closed my first round of financing on March 9th, put it all into Silicon Valley Bank, um, had a, a sort of uh, interesting weekend a couple weekends ago, got my money back. Um, I'm closing on my second round of financing, actually, um, you know, uh, this, this, uh, today's Friday, uh, next week. Um, and I've partnered up with a guy I've known for a long time, Bill Gross. Um, Bill runs Idea Lab, which is the oldest um, tech incubator in the United States. He's, uh, he's launched 175 companies, about how many, 50 of which have had a successful IPO or, or acquisition. Uh, he's raised over $4 billion in his career. So it's really sort of 30 year energy, uh, energy veteran meets uh, 30 year tech startup veteran. And we're coming together to try to go and capitalize on everything I just talked about in, in the energy transition. So, um, yeah, so anyway, I'm pretty sure that's, that's what I had. I think uh, they wanted me to leave a few minutes for Q&A, so uh, fire away. So I, I know there are a lot of students in the room, and I want to make sure we prioritize their questions first. So any students have any questions for Paul? Perfect, Jetson. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Paul. My name is Jetson. I'm an EC student, and I'm graduating in two months. I uh, want to thank you for your information, and thank you for everything you do for planet Earth. Um, my question is for, for students and aspiring climate tech entrepreneurs who are looking to become a responsible leader and leading, um, scaling up climate tech solutions, what are some advices for people like us? Yeah. So, you know, one thing I would just say to you, um, I remember... I remember the day I was, I think I was 39 or something like that, and I got my first really big job where I had thousands of people reporting to me. I had hundreds of millions of dollars of sort of budget that I was responsible for. And I remember having this feeling, and, and keep in mind, like I turned, I'm 55, I turned 39. You know, when I turned 39, like not, not a lot of people were talking about climate change and the energy transition and all that kind of stuff, but I mean, but people were, if, if you were listening. And I remember sitting there and thinking to myself, like, oh, I'm so happy I got this promotion. And then I just had this really sort of heavy feeling like, holy shit, like maybe I'm one of the people that, you know, needs to do something about this. And, and part of the reason was that most of the people, you know, I happened, I, I, you know, I got ahead pretty early in my career. There weren't a lot of 39-year-old people who were at my level. The people who were were like 55-year-olds like I am now. And they didn't really get climate change. You know, they just didn't see the urgency. And so... I, you know, so what I would say to you is, um, as, a, as a younger person who gets it and who has that sense of mission, um, you know, really tap into that sense of mission. You know, 
What you don't have right now is experience. What you do have is energy and enthusiasm that as a 55 year old, I'm really jealous of. Um, and so, you know, just understand that that's your superpower. It's your, it's your sense of mission. It's, your, it's your, the energy that you bring. And then, you know, the other thing coming out of school at Carnegie Mellon with an EC degree, you know, the old guys, 55 year olds, they don't know how to use chat GP, GT, GPT. They don't, I mean, all the, you know, all the stuff, I mean, you, like all, all the, the latest tools and, and technology and all that kind of stuff. You know, I, one of the things I loved doing um, in one of my previous roles was you'd put a bunch of older engineers together with a bunch of younger engineers. And first of all, you know, the younger guys did most of the work, uh, guys and gals. But also, you know, when it came time to do things like computational fluid dynamics simulations, the older guys didn't do that, you know. But on the other hand, the older guys had a bunch of scars on their backs and had made mistakes a bunch of times and, and helped guide the younger guys and gals to, you know, and, and it, just watching that dynamic is so cool. So, so it's tap into the, your, your energy, tap into the fact that you're, you, you've got a state-of-the-art understanding of the latest tools and technologies, um, and tap into your, your, you know, your sense of mission. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Hi, uh, my name is Hannah. I'm a PhD student in the material science and engineering department. Um, so you mentioned a lot about hydrogen, and in the hydrogen conversation, I haven't heard a lot about materials issues, like hydrogen being able to permeate through steel and through concrete. I was wondering if you had a sense of where business thinks we are with those problems versus where we actually are. Yeah, that's a great question. So, so most of the natural gas pipelines, especially the interstate pipelines that are in place in the United States, um, cannot carry hydrogen because of the, 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 the uh, weld of heat affected zone gets embrittled by hydrogen, right? Um, so we either need to find a way to sleeve them or coatings for them, or we need to build new hydrogen pipelines. Uh, when I was doing this at Mitsubishi, we just basically said, you know what, we're not gonna screw around with trying to use natural gas pipelines. What we're gonna do is use their rights away, and we're gonna build just new dedicated hydrogen pipelines. Um, you know, when you build a power plant, I mean, building a pipeline sounds awful, but when you build a power plant and you spend, you know, $1.5 billion for a 1,200 megawatt power plant, putting in a, a pipeline is not that huge of an expense. It is a, sort of a big deal in terms of, you know, getting, getting it all done. But if you can find an existing right away, that gets easier. And, and I'm also, I'm somewhat hopeful, although time will tell, you know, Part of the reason it's so hard to get a pipeline done right now is there's a lot of environmental groups that discovered that the way they can keep fossil fuels in the ground is to make it really hard to move them through pipelines, right? And so what I'm hoping is that a pipeline that's carrying renewable energy maybe won't get quite so much resistance, you know? And, and uh, so, so anyway, yeah, I mean, having said all that, there, there are people who are working on a couple really interesting things that could utilize the existing hydrogen or existing natural gas pipelines. One is some membrane technology where you put in 20% or 10% hydrogen on one end and you can take out pure hydrogen on the other end using, uh, you know, uh, some advanced membrane technology. Um, and then the other is there's all sorts of people trying to figure out, like I said earlier, coatings, sleeves, you know, those sorts of things. So uh, we'll see what emerges out of all that. But if we have to build all new pipelines, it's, it's, it sounds like a big deal. It's not. I mean, you know, last thing I'll say, you know, like, the, like the Permian basin, which didn't exist 20 years ago and now has, you know, miles and miles of pipelines running all over the place. We did it all in the last 20 years. So we can build a bunch of hydrogen pipelines if we need to. Any other students? Oh. Getting my steps in. Hello. Thank you, I'm Mr. Brownie, for presenting. My name's Stefan, I'm an MBA student. Uh, I had a question on, uh, you, know, you talked about a lot of the, the private equity, the, the capital that's flowing into this, this industry. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act also has brought in a lot of money and a lot of companies are coming in from overseas even. Uh, but can you talk about uh, your approach to some of the bottlenecks in the industry, particularly on the transmission side? You know, you've got these interconnection queues that, have, that take six plus years to get through and um, you know, all these projects that are being proposed but not many 
uh, there'll be limited uh, number of projects coming to fruition. Uh, how, what do you think is the solution there as far as uh, any policy? Yeah. Um, and then the second piece uh, on long duration storage, how do you uh, get buy-in from some of the utilities on understanding that they will need this in the future uh, for th these very expensive projects like pump storage yeah. hydro? So I'm gonna answer your second question first, because uh, I, I sort of love answering this question because I did it. You know, so, you know, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, first time I went in and met with them four years ago, and said, let's go build a green hydrogen power plant, you know, where you're gonna retire that coal-fired power plant. Um, I, I, they didn't laugh at me, but like it wasn't a good meeting. You know, I, it just, it really didn't go very well. Um, and there weren't many people in the room I came back six months later, and in between that time, the um, Los Angeles City Council voted 12 to zero that they're not gonna build any more natural gas. Uh, and, and in fact, they have to retire their existing natural gas power plants in the LA basin. I came back for a meeting with them, and there were a lot more people in the room, and they were sort of leaning across the table, right? But we didn't make a sale. And then six months later, we came back, and, and now California had passed, you know, their, uh, what is it, AB 32, and, um, uh, and the, the, their board of directors had required them to get to net zero and all sorts of things had happened. And we came into that meeting and it was just like, oh, my good friend Paul, you know, like, how, can, how are we gonna get this done? Uh, so, you know, a lot of, it's a lot of, you know, utilities are, Utilities are organizations that 90% of the input they get is criticism. So they're very cautious, and they need to be, because you know, a lot of them are, are monopolies that are regulated, and I mean, it's just a really tough space they're in, so they, they don't want to make mistakes. So you have to understand that they need a, a, you know, they need a sense of urgency to do something, and sometimes if you come in and you're a little, er a little bit early, it's just come back and see them in six months. And so, so with LADWP, um, that's sort of the way it went. And now, uh, I mean, one of the favorite moments of my whole career was um, Marty Adams, who's the, basically the, the CEO of LADWP, when we, we basically got this thing to financial close. And uh, I went out to dinner with him, and he called me his partner in crime, and which I just took as a big, you know, uh, I don't know, endorsement. So, it, it, so, uh, so like I said, now, in unregulated markets where um, you've, got, you've got independent power producers who don't have the kind of a balance sheet that a utility does and they have to clear an auction, um, you know, for them the sense of urgency is if, if they're gonna get paid for you know, long duration storage. And so right now in most places there's not a mechanism in place to pay them for that. But listen, it's gonna come because the, these power grids aren't gonna work unless they put those mechanisms in place. So, and, and you know, the, the RTOs and the ISOs, they'll do it when they have to. And, and so it's just a matter of sort of figuring out when they're gonna have to. Uh, to the interconnect question, so you guys are all in the PJM interconnect, the biggest interconnect in the United States. It stretches from uh, New Jersey to Chicago. Um, they just came out four months ago and said, we're so backed up with interconnects we're not even accepting any new interconnect applications till 2026. So if you wanna go start a PV solar project here in Pittsburgh, you can't even apply until 2026. So it's a huge problem. Interconnects have always been a problem, but they're a much bigger problem now just because we have to put so much renewable capacity on the grid, we've completely overwhelmed their ability to do these interconnect studies. So part of the solution to this is, you know, the problem is you have to be a pretty experienced person to do a, an interconnect study. Um, and there's just not that many of those people that have that expertise, we're gonna have to automate a significant portion of that so that you know, we have some sort of you know, very intelligent, generative AI enabled something or other that can take the place of you know, a bunch of guys my age who've been doing this for years and years and it's, it's just not a lot of them. So, uh, so but listen, it has to happen so it will. You know, so it's just have faith as an entrepreneur that those kind of things will get sorted out. It might take a year or two or three or four, and that, that is a problem if you're burning cash as a, as a, as a startup. But, um, but it, it, I mean, listen, you know, like I lived in California when we elected uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger because we were having rolling blackouts. Uh, 
I was in a guy's office in Algeria once who told me how hot it had been the past summer. And when I left, my Algerian guy said, did you understand what he was saying? And I said, no. And he goes, well, we had rolling blackouts and they, they burned his office down. You know, like regime change happens when the power grid doesn't work. So people will figure it out, but they won't figure it out until they have to. Uh, thanks for a great talk, uh, including the part where you criticized linear thinking uh, while standing in front of a graph constructed to take nonlinear things and make them linear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my question is, is this. All of, uh, um, all of the inspiring examples that you showed us there, one way or another, represent large-scale subsidization, either from the private sector or, the, obviously, the public sector. How far can we go? Can we go um, 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 subsidizing the green technology uh, without taxing the brown technology? Yeah, so, um, so just uh, before I answer your question, that project in Utah that I talked about, we got to financial close before the Inflation Reduction Act passed. Um, so we did get a $500 million loan from the Department of Energy, but that loan has to be paid back. So, um, so that got done without really substantial subsidy. Now, but we're gonna need the subsidies to get a lot of this stuff done. Um, so yeah, this massive subsidy, I, I, I guess your, your question was, when do we have to start penalizing the brown stuff? Was, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I, no. I, 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 they're, they're not rate of return only. Oh, no, 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 what I said is they're blue chip. So it was a Singapore sovereign wealth fund, two Canadian pension funds, and a US insurer. These, those, those people expect a return on their investment. I, I promise you that. Um, so I, they're blue chip in the sense like they're the best names out there is sort of what I meant by that. Um, but yeah, so when are we gonna have to start penalizing? So listen, if you own a coal-fired power plant today in PJM, like you're going bankrupt. And, and the reason is that um, you're an energy producer and renewables produce energy a lot cheaper than a coal-fired power plant does. Um, and so the only way you stay alive is with capacity payments, but even capacity payments now, the battery energy storage projects are beating the coal-fired guys on capacity. So, the, the, you know, there's already an economic dis disincentive, some of which is created by the fact that those renewables are subsidized with an investment tax credit or a production tax credit. So, so the, you know, the, the penalty on the brown guys is that they're not getting the kind of subsidies that the green guys are, and the green guys are beating them in, you know, competitive things. It's, you know, now if, if you're in a regulated market where you don't have that same kind of thing, What's happening there is, you know, every utility in the United States has recently set a net zero target, either 2040 or 2045 or 2050. Um, and it's because their boards are requiring them to do it. Their investors are requiring them to do it. Uh, their regulators are requiring them to do it. So, um, and so the, the disincentive that's coming in, in for the utilities, uh, the regulated utilities is just, they're just getting all this ESG pressure um, from a, a bunch of different stakeholders and, you know. So it's a, it's a combination of market mechanisms and, you know, other things that are, that are causing the disincentive for uh, fossil fuels. Hi, my name is Michael. I work at uh, Incubator, by, uh, funded by a company that sells a lot of energy uh, sheets, actually. Um, so I'm thinking about, you know, the impetus for a lot of the changes you're kind of trying to navigate through and like you're a big figure and you got funding from the government and other venture, I'm sure many other funding, like what role does the consumer have in shaping this? Like their natural needs, preferences, tastes, and like, well, yeah, what role will they play? Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's a bunch I did talk about today. There's a bunch I didn't talk about, you know, I, I mean, I basically just gave you a, you know, utility scale power generation presentation, but of course, you know, there's EVs, there's, distributed energy resources, there's energy, you know, there's all sorts of other things that are going to be really important that I didn't talk about. Um, and, and one of them is going to be um, getting individual people and, and also commercial and industrial folks to start reducing their energy usage and also reducing it during like the peak demand time so that we don't have to spend as much on energy storage because energy storage is not going to be cheap. 
Um, and as I just said, it's also, you know, you, you lose some energy round trip when you, when you have to go through any sort of a storage. So, um, so yeah, demand management. Um, one of the things I, you know, one of the things I'm really thinking a lot about, and I don't, I, other people might have better ideas than this, but I'm just fascinated by ChatGPT and the, the idea that I can have an, an artificial intelligence that is with me and is watching you know, is, is taking care of all of my, uh, my uh, um, energy management things. You know, it, it knows if the lights are on, it knows if my dishwasher's running, it knows is it peak or is it, you know, some off-peak time when, when electricity's cheap. It's, you know, I, it, it's so inconvenient for an individual person to think about all that stuff and manage all that stuff. If we can turn that inconvenience into a convenience using artificial intelligence, I actually think that's a really, you know, great opportunity to, you know, to, to get something done on the consumer side of things. Um, and, you know, but, but let me just tell you, I, I'm an expert on the stuff I just talked about, not, not on that kind of stuff. So you could, you could probably get a better answer from someone else. I think we have time for either one or maybe two questions if they're quick. Hi, my name is David. I'm a master's student in the Energy Science, Technology, and Policy program, and um, I have a hydrogen question. So hydrogen is going to get tugged between the transportation, uh, electric power, and industrial sectors over the next few years, especially as we start putting more green hydrogen to the, the supply chain. So when you have these sectors fighting over our green hydrogen, um, where might we see the most impact for this green hydrogen to go to immediately until we have enough for everybody? Yeah. Really, really good question that I spend a lot of time thinking about. So first of all, green hydrogen is not a fuel. Green hydrogen is stored renewable energy. Mm -hmm. So most people think of it as a fuel, and, and because most of the green hydrogen early thinking was around mobility, and so the, the folks who came into that were car companies and oil and gas majors and you know, folks who, are used to, who deal with fuels. And so they came into it with like a fuel kind of a mentality. But if you come, I came into it from power generation, and to me it was just always obvious that green hydrogen is stored renewable power. It's not a fuel. So if you start from that place, you actually end up in a really different place than if you start out by thinking of it as a fuel. So I'll just give you an example of that. Green hydrogen is pretty expensive compared to natural gas. Um, and even if we drop the cost quite a bit, it's still going to be pretty expensive to natural compared to natural gas. But you know what? It's super cheap compared to lithium ion battery storage. So if you think about it as stored energy and you're looking at it versus other stored energy alternatives, it actually looks pretty darn good. Um, if you look at it as a fuel and you're looking at it after, against some fossil fuel competitors without carbon abatement, it actually looks, it's a loser, right? So, um, so that's one place I've started. So it was always my view, I mean, going back five years ago, that we'd get that big power project done that I just talked about before the first, you know, mobility project of the same scale would get done, and, and I was right. Um, and it's because, you know, we needed to store that renewable power for the power grid before we needed it for mobility applications. The other thing you gotta think about with mobility is the batteries are just getting better fast. And so, uh, Five years ago, I think everybody assumed that, you know, for uh, for passenger vehicles, it's just going to go all EV, all EV, no doubt about it. But like a long haul truck is going to go green hydrogen. I, you know, it's not so obvious to me now that the that the that's not actually going to be electrified with battery energy storage. So, I think in mobility, um, just the competition between f fuel cell, green hydrogen, and and battery, you know, battery electric vehicles is where they meet, end up meeting in the market. It's, it's moving more and more, you know, in the way of battery energy storage. So, but then the, on the other side of that, you know, a huge amount of emissions are in the in, in, in industrial uh, uses of heat and steam. And heat and steam are really great applications for uh, green hydrogen. So, um, anyway, how that's all going to play out is, I think, yet to be determined. But, um, but in the power space, it's already happening. And so uh, I have, this is where I have a lot of conviction for green hydrogen. These are fantastic questions. We have uh, time for one last question, and I will come over here.
Um, my name is Sierra and I have a background in business. Um, and so I would love to know if Continuum has any plans. Uh, you had talked about um, Continuum being your entrepreneurial endeavors. And so I'd love to know if you have any plans to help um, other startups who are trying to get into the same sector. Yeah, great, thanks, good question. Yeah, so one of the neat things about teaming up with Bill um, at Idea Labs is, uh, I, I, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm sort of eating my own cooking here at the moment, so what I'm about to tell you, I'm experiencing myself. You, when you start out at Idea Labs, um, we give you enough money to, to stand up a team and to get rolling with your business. And we only invest in, you know, we only, of course we only do that if we like your idea, but if we like your idea, we're gonna give you enough funding to get started. And on day one, we've got an HR department that'll set up medical benefits for you and do all that hard HRE kind of stuff. We've got an IT team that'll set up all your IT requirements. We have a legal team that'll help you with all your legal needs. Um, we have a, a, com a communications team that helped me put my presentation together that I just showed you. Um, so we've got all that sort of back office stuff that as an entrepreneur is a real pain in the rear end. And, what, and so we could take all that off your plate and just let you focus on the, the most important thing right now, which is your business and sort of the front end of your business and developing your products and doing all those sorts of things that, uh, you know, and, and not having to worry about all that back office stuff. Now in return, we want a percentage of your business. So it's, you know, there's, nothing's free in, in life. But, um, and then the other thing is we have a lot of deep pocketed um, uh, folks who want to invest in the energy transition. So after you use our capital and you need to go out and raise your next round, um, we, we, can, we can help make the introductions to some people that are really interested in investing in the energy transition. So, um, so that's what we can do to help entrepreneurs. And then the other thing is, I mean, I don't know what you thought of my presentation, but you also get access to people like me who've got you know, experience in the, in the energy industry and can help you think your way through your business plan and, and also help introduce you to you know, industry executives and potential customers and all that kind of good stuff. Well, thank you, Paul, uh, for answering all these great questions. Uh, join me in giving him a round of applause. Okay, thanks. <laughs>